Um, yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, so I'm going to follow on Bot's overview lecture, uh, mainly concentrating on the atmosphere and look at the ocean side of things in the northern Indian Ocean. And we're going to focus eventually on the Bay of Bengal, although initially we'll kind of start broader scale and just think about the Indian Ocean and how it's special and different. This also builds on the readings that maybe some of you did <laughs> um, that we sent you via email. So some of this material will be familiar, although um, it takes a little bit of a different approach to the uh, upper ocean and thinking about upper ocean processes that will hopefully also introduce material that Leah is going to um, continue tomorrow. So. Uh, I initially have, hopefully this is going to play a movie, although it looks like it's not. Hold on, let me see if I can start it. It was just a second ago. There we go. So this is showing, um, NASA, it's a NASA wind product, the Mirror product, a reanalysis product. And it's plotting two levels of winds. The, the, the speed of the winds is shown in color. So the red are fast winds and they're upper level winds. So you see our jet streams, basically. But the white are primarily showing the surface winds. And so um, the movie started May 1st. It's going to go through June. And if it ends, I'll start it again. Um, but I wanted to ask the question, what's different about the Indian Ocean? And so I want you to look across the tropics, look at the winds, look at the structure of the basins, and tell me what you see about the Indian Ocean that is different than the Pacific or the Atlantic. Um, yeah, so that's an open question to the group. What's different about the Indian Ocean? Yeah, so the big thing is the zonal direction of winds. Um, it's, if you look carefully and uh, north of the equator, not so much south of the equator, right? They're pretty consistent even in the Indian Ocean south of the equator. But now as it loops back around, especially as we move into the summer monsoon, you'll start to see um, Easterly, uh, sorry, westerly winds, eastward winds in the northern Indian Ocean. What's the other big difference just with the morphology, if you will, of the Indian Ocean compared to the Pacific or the Atlantic? It's closed. And so those two factors really strongly influence the ocean circulation. Um, and so we'll, talking, we'll be talking quite a bit about those, especially in these earlier slides. Um, but we'll see that throughout the um, this set of slides. I'm going to keep trying to go back there to start my computer. So here's another simulation also from NASA. It's going to show you on the summer monsoon on the left and then the winter monsoon on the right. The winds, surface winds are again plotted from that same mirror product. The color right now is precipitation, although it's about to switch to temperature. Um, and so they light up another color bar. And so now you can see the difference in the surface temperature in the summer monsoon and in the winter monsoon. And this movie will flip again as well. Um, but you can see, rather than just looking at the summer monsoon, like our last picture, yeah, it's going to merge and then we'll start over again. Sorry. <laughs> These movies are kind of tricky. Let me replay that. Um, so this was to show uh, what Bot emphasized, that during the winter monsoon, we have the winds have switched direction from the summer monsoon. The other thing is, is if you look at the precipitation, especially in um, uh, over India and over Asia, you can see that the summer monsoon really dominates the precipitation. If you look at the temperature differences between the water and the land, you'll also see something very different. So you'll notice the diurnal cycle of heating, particularly over land. Um, the other thing is, let me start it one more time. Sorry about that. <laughs> Although I can't make NASA make my own movies, so it's just what we've got. Um, so if we watch, I want to just talk about the temperature differences when we get to that stage. It's, it's fun to see the precipitation again here, though. Um, and so much stronger precipitation in the summer monsoon, as Bot mentioned and talked about the variability in that signal. Now look at the relative difference between the ocean temperature and the land temperature in the two phases of the monsoon. Um, so it's quite clear that in winter, uh, land tends to be cooler and water tends to be warmer. And so that, in part, is helping drive the surface winds. And then the opposite is true in the summer monsoon. That's the diurnal cycle. So each, if you look, we're able to follow the time steps, which are really small down below. That's just the daily heating cycle. It's pretty dramatic over land. Um, okay. Uh huh. 
Yeah, so it's definitely up at mid latitudes, but it, it, you know, the presence of water and land also affects the meandering in the jet stream as well. Um, I, I, we could go back to that movie, but maybe after the talk to just continue and look at, in particular, what you wanted to ask. Oh, I keep forgetting I have this magic button. Sorry about that. And so I have one more movie. And I've cut off half of it because I only want you to look at the Indian Ocean, and it was a global movie. Um, so if you think about precipitation, which had a maximum in the summer monsoon, that's obviously going to have a direct impact on salinity. And, and this movie is showing salinity measured from space from the SMAP mission. And again, I've blanked off most of the globe because I want you to focus on the Indian Ocean. And hopefully in the Bay of Bengal, you can see that deep blue that starts to occupy the northern bay. So that's very fresh water. And if you could see the time scale, which I'm sorry, this bar, oh no, it's up there. Um, the darkest blues are coming at the end of the summer monsoon into um, September. And, and so that's all of that precipitation um, from river as well as local precipitation over the bay accumulating. And then somehow there's an exchange between the bay and the neighboring basins. And if you just look at the gradient in salinity between the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea, it's, it's very large, and that's another aspect of this area um, that's kind of special. You have a, a really salty region right next to a really fresh region, and that has implications to the vertical structure and stratification um, across the northern Indian Ocean. Okay, so today's talk, the hope is, is <laughs> we're gonna talk a little bit, some basics um, about the processes. So in particular, I wanna talk about wind stress and Ekman transports, which were mentioned in the paper that you read, and we've already talked a little bit about that. Um, we'll look at the surface heat flux and how that's calculated. Uh, we'll look at freshwater sources and just the observed seasonal cycle in the bay. Um, and then we'll talk about implications for circulation and stratification and kind of intermixed as we talk about those processes. And then hopefully, if I have time, I'm going to talk about the 2018 cruise, which is sort of a base for some of the projects that are going to be worked on. And um, if I don't get to that this morning, we'll talk about that uh, after um, this lecture, but when we introduce the product, projects. i got to stop walking to my computer. I'm sorry, that's super hard for me not to do. Uh, OK, so um, the wind blows on the surface of the ocean. What happens? Lots of things. One of those things, and the only one that I want to focus on this morning, is what's known as the Ekman spiral. So for any of you doing oceanography, this is um, familiar to you. For those of you that are coming in from different fields, this is maybe new. So just kind of quickly, um, here, is the, here is the expression for the surface stress. Uh, in it, we have the density of air. We have a drag coefficient, CD. Um, and then U10 is the relative wind speed at 10 meters to the ocean. So it accounts, you know, you're looking at the difference between the winds and the ocean when, when you look at U10. And then the wind stress is a vector, so one of these is still a vector component. Um, when the winds blow on the ocean and they exert a stress, um, that's great. It starts to accelerate the water but the Earth is also rotating. And so the Coriolis force will want to um, basically turn that current to the right as friction starts to um, help the momentum penetrate into the ocean. And so we have the surface winds blowing here. When you have an Ekman balance, the surface currents are actually at a 45 degree angle if it's a homogeneous ocean with constant viscosity, uh, which is kind of interesting. And then they, in the northern hemisphere, they turn to the right, or they, with the stress at the surface, they'll turn to the right of the stress. Um, and it's a pretty simple formulation. If you have a homogeneous ocean with constant viscosity, um, you can just integrate the momentum equations and the continuity equation, and you come up with a simple expression for what we call the Ekman transport, which is the vertical integral of the Ekman currents. And it ends up just depending on the curl um, of the wind stress over the Coriolis frequency. So here, rho naught is the density of the ocean. It's a constant in this case. Tau y is the north-south uh, wind stress. Tau x is the east-west wind stress. And then f is the Coriolis parameter, which depends on latitude. Um, the Ekman depth, kind of interestingly, actually still maintains the viscosity term. So the actual depth 
um, that that spiral is distributed over depends on the friction um, in, in the model. And then, so if you have these transports near the surface, they're moving water around in the horizontal. You can get convergences and divergences of that water, and that'll lead to Ekman pumping and suction. And so basically, the convergences will lead to downwelling. You can't just keep piling up water. It has to go somewhere. And divergences will lead to upwelling. And so what's really kind of amazing about this is if we measure the stress at the surface of the ocean and take the curl, we can infer something about the upward and downward motions in the interior of the ocean. Um, which is pretty, pretty powerful. Uh, and so, next slide. <laughs> Hopefully this figure is familiar. This came from one of the paper readings, the shot at all paper. Um, and so it shows the wind stress in the vectors and then in color, so the northeast monsoon I put on the left, southwest monsoon I put on the right. He had a few other um, periods, but I just limited the slide to those two. So you see the winds that Bot showed at the end of his lecture and that we looked at on earlier slides. And then the color, they're plotting the depth of the 20 degree isotherm. And so when this is deeper, that's suggesting a region of downwelling, so downward motion. And when it's, when it's closer to the surface, that's likely a region where you have upwelling. And so let's talk for just a minute about the Ekman transports, which I've told you in the northern hemisphere are to the right of the winds. In the southern hemisphere, I didn't tell you this, but they're to the left of the winds. Um, so let's think just a little bit about the Ekman transport that we would get north of the equator. So if you look right around maybe five degrees north here, um, in both of these pictures, they're not very interesting, but which direction would you start expect the Ekman transport to be? And what about its strength? Will it be strong or weak? So if someone can answer that one, that's the easiest one. What do you got? <laughs> So it's to the right of the winds. It's also proportional to the wind stress over F. Um, we're going to kind of ignore F here, although its variability is important. Uh, but it's to the right of the winds. The winds are very small, right? The size of the vector means the stress is small. And so it's, it's sort of to the northeast, but it's pretty small. What about in the southern um, uh, hemisphere, south of the bay? Which direction is the Ekman transport? So it's to the left in the southern hemisphere. So the winds are, in both pictures, although they're a little stronger here, are blowing like this. So to the left would be down to the southwest, right? And if you look, let's just consider the wind stress component for a minute. So right, the winds are really strong in the middle. If you're right at the equator, you're not gonna have any Ekman transport. So because Coriolis force is zero. And so it's zero there. They're really strong right here. And so if you think about, you know, you have Ekman transport down to the southwest, maybe around five degrees, it goes to zero at the equator. And so you have a divergence in that region. That's gonna lead to an upwelling of water. And so if you look at the color of that 20 degree isotherm, you do indeed see that it's closer to the surface. And then if you look here, right, the wind stress is actually decreasing in magnitude and the Coriolis parameter is changing as well. The net effect is actually to lead to a divergence of water and you have an upwell, or I'm sorry, other way, convergence, and you have a downwelling and you have a very deep um, level for that 20 degree ice storm. The other place that's, I mean, the northern bay is sort of hard to detect any signal. Um, and that again is, something maybe special about these basins. The one exception is in this particular case, in the Arabian Sea, you have very strong winds. There's clearly a deep, um, a deepening of that 20 degree isotherm. And again, if you think about the Ekman transports there, they're to the right of the winds. Um, however, as you move out of the Arabian Sea, they're getting weaker, and so there's a curl in the wind stress. And if you play with the right hand rule and just do the curl of the wind stress, you'll see that you do indeed have a downward um, Ekman motion on average in the Arabian Sea. And so just as a check on that, the next slide, uh, I'm showing you the climatology from scatterometer data. So these are yet, yeah, sorry, read a rat. Uh, what are the characteristic uh, changes in the sea, level, sea surface height uh, when you talk about upwelling or downwelling? 
Yeah, so each one of these will also have a response on the sea surface height, right? If you have a convergence of water, you will have a, um, an elevation of your sea surface height. So anywhere you see a, uh, a depression of this 20 degree isotherm that is likely associated with a, um, a sea surface high, if you will, and the, vice, the opposite is true as well, where you have a shoaling of this, you probably have a depression of the sea surface. And the, the difference depends on the density difference between air and water. And so when you have, um, you know, if you have a displacement of, uh, I don't know, what is it? Is it a factor of 100 difference? I'm looking at Eric. So anyone can answer that question. Um, so basically, if you, if you have a 100 meter displacement of the um, pycnocline, your um, displacement at the surface is order meter or smaller. Does that answer your question? OK. So that's great. Because that, then you can think about flow, which we'll do in a second. So what we just said is this is likely a sea surface high, and this is likely a sea surface low. And so that tells you something about the circulation at the surface if you or have a geostrophic balance. But first, let's just look at um, the measurements of the curl of the wind stress. So this is from a climatology of um, scatterometer winds that Craig Rizian and Dudley Telton put together. Um, these data are available online. I find them very useful. Um, but what you can see here is the January. Um, this is just the curl of the wind stress. And so be a little careful here, because the Ekman pumping actually depends on the curl of the wind stress over F, but ignore that for now. Um, and so you can see um, the global patterns of that. And what I wanted to do was just jump and forth, back and forth between January and July. And so if you look at the sign of the curl of the wind stress in these two seasons, what hopefully you've noticed is, again, in most equatorial regions, the sign stays the same, the exception being the Bay of Bengal, where it changes sign and the winds have changed direction. So that's not really all that surprising. If we zoom into the um, Indian Ocean, um, just to show you, so January is on the left, July is on the right. Again, this is the wind stress curl. You can see, indeed, in the northern Indian Ocean, there is a dramatic change in the, the sign of that wind stress curl, um, where the regions of intense wind stress curl are located. And if we go back to our pictures that we had before of January and thinking about the Ekman convergences and divergences, for example, um, in the upper plot, we said this was a region um, here where we had downward motion, right? And if you look here, the wind stress curl tends to be positive, but the Coriolis parameter is negative. And so if the, the curl of that is indeed a negative number or, or downwelling. Um, and then you can also see the shoaling region that's south of um, the equator is associated with an upward motion um, based on the X. And then in the northern Bay of Bengal in summer, you can see the Arabian Sea signal that we talked about, where there is a really strong region of um, negative curl. And there, the Coriolis parameter is positive. It's the northern hemisphere, so that's associated with downwind. So all of that was kind of in our uh, introductory material. So like Rita Brat kind of suggested, if you think about what that means for the sea surface slopes, and if the currents are what we call in geostrophic balance, which we'll learn more about, I think, in the third lecture, or the third day, um, you know something about the direction of those currents. And so the biggest signal in our plot was down here between maybe 5 degrees south and 20 degrees south, where we had, um, keep forgetting what it was, the 20 degree isotherm was near the surface. And so the um, surface was a sea surface low. Right? And then we had a sea surface high further to the south. In the southern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere, the rule for geostrophy is, is high to the right. And in the southern hemisphere, it's, it's high to the left. And so if you have a low up to the north and a high down to the south, you will have flow that's heading to the west. And that is indeed what we see in all, both seasons in terms of the equatorial current systems. It gets really complicated up in the northern um, basin. And we're going to talk about maybe why that is in a little bit. But I mean, these arrows are just going everywhere, right? They're kind of hard to infer, even in the simple schematic. Um, so I did go back and just grab 
an earlier publication by the two of the same authors that was a little simplified in the Bay of Bengal region, just to call out some names that you might hear um, this week. In particular, we had the northeast monsoon current, the southwest monsoon current, these reverse directions with the, um, with the monsoon winds. You also have the East Indian coastal current. Um, similarly, you have the West Indian coastal current that also reverse directions. And then in the Bay of Bengal, there's a recirculation that occurs um, regularly, which is known as the Sri Lanka Dome. And um, those are the major current systems that you might actually see named. So, you know, in part, if you actually look at, here's another pretty NASA movie. Um, if you actually look at circulation and not just these average schematic senses, I mean, this is part of the problem with making a schematic, right? Um, so this is now just showing surface currents from a reanalysis product. Um, and you can see, like, look along the coast of Africa, how complicated that circulation actually is in the western um, northern Indian Ocean. You do see here, um, there's the tendency for uh, westward flow south of Sri Lanka. Sorry, this movie keeps going around the entire globe, but I just wanted to show the, um, the Indian Ocean part. Um, but there's, you know, there's eddies. The currents are not steady features. They change. They meander. Um, there's all types of information that get fed into those schematics. And so it, um, and particularly in a place where there's so much transition and, and small scale variability, uh, they can become complicated. Here's just a more quantitative view of that same idea. These are, this is from Deepak. Um, this is the Oscar current velocity. So it's a satellite product. It has Ekman transports in it, as well as geostrophic estimates from the measured sea surface heights. Um, this is a period of three years. The time step is two weeks. The time is actually scrolling here, but you can't, unfortunately, you can't see it. Um, so a challenge to you is to try to identify the northeast and the southwest monsoon from the direction of the currents. Let me start that again. Um, it starts in 2013, and it's a full three years. So. Let's do this one more time. So what, what do you, let me just ask what you see. What's the, what's the clearest signal to you in this particular movie? What do you see? What, westward. Yeah, there's westward propagation of stuff. Who knows, what is that for the oceanographers in the room? Yeah, it's the Rossby wave signal, and it, it just dominates this movie. That's what I see as well. I have to kind of blur my eyes a little bit to even pick out the south, um, uh, west, and northeast monsoon currents. However, you can do it. Um, so here, for example, this ends in December. And if you look at the flow south of Sri Lanka, you can see that um, northeast monsoon current. Um, what else? You, you can also see a coastal current, although again, there's lots of meanders and eddies in it. So for those of you that know something about satellite products, what's missing in this? I said what was in it when I said you know, what's being calculated with the Oscar velocities. What are some things that a satellite product might be missing? What's that? So, so uh, this, so the Oscar velocity is a combination of geostrophy and Ekman, basically. The time step is two weeks, um, and you know it's it's set by the resolution of the satellite. So, with those things in mind, what are some dynamics or processes that you think might be missing in this movie? I'm sorry, I hear things, but I actually can't hear what's being said. What's that? Yeah, so, so there is a resolution of time step. Anything below the Nyquist sampling will not be resolved in that. So things like tides are definitely not in here. Um, there's other motions as well. What else? The, Absolutely. That's, yeah, there's also a spatial resolution. It's averaging over that spatial resolution, and so you will not see um, smaller scale motion. Uh, and then, was, did anyone else say something? Yeah, so it's a surface product. 
it's trying to do something in terms of guessing a little bit maybe about the internal structure, like the Ekman depth, but it's not necessarily right. And Jared, for example, has done some work to try to improve Ekman depth and Ekman transport calculations in this product, so that's a great um, point. The other thing that I think about is like a, around the edges, right? Like when you get close to land, you're also going to have issues with, with these types of products. I think you've got most of the things that I had thought about. Okay, um, so it's, circulation's complicated. It varies in time. This is another plot by Deepak. He now has taken, in the upper set of panels, he's taken those Oscar current velocities and just averaged them by the time of the year. So here's the northeast monsoon. He broke up March and April in the transition, the southwest monsoon, and then the transition from the southwest to the northeast monsoon. And so if you look carefully at the vectors, so for example, in the southwest monsoon, you see the southwest monsoon current. Right, you see flow south of Sri Lanka that's coming into the bay and heading across the bay. And the opposite's true in the northeast monsoon. You can also see um, some intensification along the coast in some of these images. The color here is actually the eddy kinetic energy. So it's a measure of how of those um, wiggles and instabilities and, and Rossby waves that we saw. And so you can see that there's quite a bit of variability in the currents that are plotted here. The lower set of panels, I'm not going to talk about too much, but I wanted to show these because they're relevant to the third project, um, or the, actually the project on near inertial wave modeling. What Deepak's done here is he's plotted the near inertial input into the mixed layer of the ocean. And so you can see the variability by season in terms of that input as well. And so, you know, we've talked about the winds and how they drive Ekman transport. It's not the only thing the winds do when they force the ocean. Another big one is they force um, internal waves at the near inertial frequency. And this is telling you something about how, um, how much energy the winds are actually dumping into the near inertial waves, or at least dumping into the mixed layer. And so for example, you'll see individual storm tracks. This is HUD HUD, I think, is that right, Deepak? Um, here's uh, Cyclone Maddie down here and another low pressure that came. This is for a particular year, 2014. But there's also a seasonal cycle where you have stronger winds in the southwest and northeast monsoon, um, creating a little more uh, near inertial wind input. OK, so that was sort of my summary on um, wind forcing and circulation. So now let's jump to the other thing I want to talk about, which is um, the stratification in the Bay of Bengal and what's setting that. And so that, that feeds back into our sort of knowledge of air-sea processes because that, in the large part, on the ocean side is, is regulated by its stratification. So when you calculate the surface heat flux um, at the interface of the ocean and atmosphere, there's four terms. There's the short wave, long, uh, the short wave radiation that's coming in, QSW. There's the outgoing long wave radiation. There is the sensible heat flux, so this is the conductive um, turbulent heat flux. And then there's the latent heat flux, which is associated with the phase change um, related to evaporation. If we look at those terms individually, so when we calculate the shortwave radiation, what we do is we measure the downward shortwave insulation at the surface. And so that measurement accounts for any clouds that are in the atmosphere. Um, and so those are taken into account. Uh, and then we also have to consider the albedo of the surface. For the ocean, it's pretty um, bland in terms of its variability, although the angle of the sun does change that albedo a little bit. Um, so that's, that's how we calculate shortwave. It's pretty easy to do as long as you're measuring this value i. The other thing that's interesting about shortwave, it's, it's the one component of heat flux that penetrates into the ocean. And so it's not just changing the surface value. That, that shortwave does penetrate into the ocean and the upper ocean, and it can um, distribute the heating. The long wave is measured um, by the clear sky. Uh, radiative value, so this is just basically a black body radiation. Um, it's, it's Planck's law or the Stefan Boltzmann law um, based on Planck's law. So sigma t to the fourth, hopefully is familiar to those of you that are from a physics background. Um, it's corrected by an emissivity because the ocean is not a perfect black body. 
Um, so that's the clear side. That's the outgoing long wave piece. However, we have to subtract the back long wave radiation from the atmosphere, and that hopefully is measured. That's this R term here. Um, however, if you're not measuring it, you can estimate it if you know things like the relative humidity, the air temperature, and cloud cover. So that's the long wave. Um, here is the latent form. Um, this depends on the density of air. It depends on the latent heat of evaporation. It's related to that evaporative component, so that needs to be in there. Um, there's this heat transfer coefficient, which is, uh, this is where some subtleties come in. I'm not going to talk about them here, but actually getting the exact value of that, um, it varies, although it's roughly around 10 to the minus 3. U10 is, again, that relative wind speed difference between the winds at 10 meters and the ocean. So wind is in there. The greater the winds, the greater the latent heat flux will be. And then the last term is, is telling you something about the moisture in the atmosphere. If you have a dry atmosphere, you're more likely to evaporate, and this number will be higher. So it depends on the relative wind speed and the moisture. Here is the expression for the sensible heat flux. Again, this is just the, the turbulent conductive heat flux. So we have the density of the atmosphere. Here we have heat capacity of the air. We have um, something similar to the latent heat transfer coefficient, but the sensible heat transfer coefficient, again, around 10 to the minus 3. Also depends on the wind speed. Faster winds, you're going to be more effective at that sensible heat flux. And then it depends on the difference between the SST and the air temperature. So if you have a small difference, this number is not going to be very big. If you have a big difference, it actually can be a contribute, uh, contribute significantly. So I want you to take what I just told you about the sensible and latent flexes. Look at the picture of SST and the winds in January versus in June. And I want you to tell me something about what you think the relative magnitudes of the latent and sensible heat uh, fluxes might be in this season versus this season. I haven't told you anything about moisture, but think about the origin of the air if you're trying to make some kind of uh, rational thought about what the moisture content might be. So any thought? Just, just a relative statement about latent heat in these two seasons. What, what are things you're going to consider? It's more in January, the latent flux. Why do you say that? Yeah, so the, the air is being sourced over the continent, and then it's encountering the northern bay. And so you have dry continental air that's, um, you know, all of a sudden over the ocean water. And so that, that moisture difference is significant. Um, what's a little interesting is the winds are a little stronger here. And that plays into it as well. Um, so you might expect a peak in latent, but it's the dry piece here does indeed dominate. We'll see that in a second. What about the sensible flux? Where do you think it might be bigger? Also think about what you know, most of you living in India, about temperature. <laughs> um, and maybe go back to Bot's lecture where he showed air temperature, because I don't show you what that is here either. Here, right, the cool colors here are 25 degrees Celsius. The reds are 30 degrees Celsius. More in July, because the winds are larger. <laughs> the SST is higher, but do you remember the sensible flux? It was proportional to the relative wind speed and the difference between the SST and the air temperature. This is kind of a hard question to answer from this. We'll look at this again. Um, but yeah, so let's think about sensible. I do have one other picture, though. Uh, these plots are not that great, but here. So this is now showing the climatology from NCEP NCAR on a daily basis. I just averaged all the days together. Starting in January through December, um, over 40 years, there's lots of things plotted here. This axis and the blue line is the east-west wind stress. The zero is right here, so you can see um, winds that are uh, to the east. No. This must be from the direction. So January, February, from the east in January, February. And then they're from the west, July, August. Um, you can see they're about the same magnitude, maybe a little bit greater in the southwest monsoon. The green line and plotted on this axis is the surface temperature averaged over the bay. It's relative to 28 degrees, but just look at the, you know, it's relatively low here, around 20, 
uh, 26 degrees, I guess, gets up to closer to 30 degrees in March, uh, or sorry, May, and then we're back down in the southwest monsoon, and then it, it continues to decrease. And then the lower plot shows precipitation, and it's just the zeros at the bottom here. And so you can see all of the rain that's coming into the bay in the southwest monsoon. Um, so we said we thought latent flux was going to be large here, and maybe also have a peak in the southwest monsoon when the winds are strong. In terms of the sensible flux, um, we don't really know. There's kind of a question there. Um, what do you think about the short wave and long wave? If you look at precipitation, look at SST, when do you think you might see a peak in the short wave radiation? Also, just take what you know about that. Clear sky, and so by this plot, the clear sky is happening here, right? So you might expect to peak March, April, somewhere in there. What about the long wave? Do you remember what its expression was? It's, it's actually lower when you have cloud cover and you get downward long wave radiation from the surface. So you might also expect it to peak also when there's clear sky, the outgoing long wave piece at least. So let's look and see what the wind stress actually, or the wind, the surface fluxes actually are in the Bay of Bengal. Watch my time a little bit. Here is just the downward heat flux. Uh, so negative values are um, cooling the ocean. Positive values are warming the ocean. Um, there's four lines here, short wave in blue, long wave in Green, sorry, I'm colorblind, and sometimes I have trouble interpreting my own colors. Um, Leighton in black, and <laughs> sensible is this color, whatever it is. Is it orange? I don't even know. Sorry. Sensible is this really small one that we couldn't come up with before because it's, it's tiny. The, the, the delta T is really small. Um, but what you see is the short wave is indeed stronger in sort of March, April when it's clear skies. Um, it's hovering on a daily average of you know, less than 300 watts per meter squared. Um, it doesn't vary a whole lot in the equatorial sort of region or tropical region. Um, if you look at long wave, there's also not a lot of variability. That's not really surprising, right? It goes like sigma t to the fourth, where t is in Kelvin. The, the overall range of that temperature over even the globe is not very large. So there's not a lot of variability in long wave, although it is indeed um, at a minima or its strongest when the clear sky conditions are out. And then the latent one's the one that's kind of interesting. It's double peaked, right? So again, it's cooling the most when the values are most negative. And so like Praveen said, it's cooling the most in January, February, where we have dry air and strong winds. But you also see that peak in the southwest monsoon. OK, so that's what's happening with the surface heat flux. That's going to influence our upper ocean temperature. Before we think about stratification, though, let's just recall, um, ocean density not only depends on temperature, it depends on salinity. So that's just one source of buoyancy. We also need to worry about precipitation and evaporation. So the total buoyancy flux can be actually written um, like the gravitational uh, acceleration, uh, the thermal expansion times this Q net over rho Cp, where this is the density of water and the heat capacity of water. But then we also have to modify it by this freshwater piece. And so if we think about evaporation minus precipitation, um, if precipitation exceeds, this is a negative number, and you have buoyancy increase in the ocean, and vice versa if evaporation wins. So here is some results uh, that were presented by Wilson and Riser, 2016. It's kind of a nice bay-wide salinity budget analysis. If you look at this histogram, though, it's telling you um, a couple different things. So it's plotting evaporation here in this gray line. So here's the zero. This is in meters per month. And so um, there is evaporation occurring throughout the year. It's not surprising. However, we really want to think about P minus E. So also plotted here are the precipitation. Uh, precipitation is this line, kind of dashed dot line that peaks in just after July, it looks like, if I'm looking at this right, so August. And so if you add these two lines, um, most of the time precipitation is dominating. And then the other freshwater source is the rivers. And so we saw in Bot's lecture, as well as in some of these movies that I was showing earlier, that a lot of the rain is happening over the land. Obviously, that eventually drains into the rivers, and that serves as a freshwater source along the boundaries for the bay. 
And that's, a, that's important. Um, and so if you look at where the rivers peak, it actually peaks just a little bit late. It's delayed relative to the peak in precipitation, which is not that surprising, but also happening um, in the southwest monsoon. And if you add precipitation, rivers, and evaporation, you get this black line. And it is only zero for a small part of the year in December, January, and March. The relative magnitudes of precipitation and river sources are about the same. It's about half and half. Um, if you were to kind of think about when you would expect the minimum salinity, it'd be sort of after this period of um, enhanced evaporation relative precipitation. So maybe May, which is what's plotted up here, the salinity in May. Um, and if you think about when you might expect to see the most fresh water in the bay, it's after all of this fresh water from both precipitation and rivers arrives. So sometime in the late fall um, or in the early fall. And here's the plot in November. And so if you just compare the salinity in the Bay of Bengal, um, you do indeed see that pattern represented. Yeah? Thanks, Manny. So I'm not going to get to the pilot cruise. I'll talk about it later. But let's just look at stratification. I've, and, and then we'll stop. So here's measurements from one of our early cruises, 2013, where a ship was driving around the bay really quickly. And we were measuring salinity and temperature. Here, the blue colors are fresh, and the red colors are salty. Um, the red colors are warm, and the cool colors are, uh, are cooler. And so you know, generally, in the northern bay, when we're up at this peak, you do see fresher water, kind of consistent with that overhead view. However, if you spread this out and look at the details, so now this is a zero to 3,000 kilometer plus survey, you can see lots of structure in the upper ocean temperature and salinity. So here's that fresh water to the north. This projector is not showing it very well, but there's these subsurface warm pockets that are sitting beneath that salinity stratified layer. You'll also see these salty pockets down here, that, that's Arabian seawater that has come into the Bay of Bengal and have these salty maxima at depth. The lower panel is showing you the vertical gradient and density, the stratification. And so when it's high, these red colors you see, um, are, they're shown in red. And so we have a mixed layer sitting at the surface where stratification is very low. And below it, you have some sharp stratification layers and then a more diffuse stratification as you move into the thermocline. We can break up the relative contributions of temperature and salinity here, and that's what's shown on this plot. Again, it's kind of uh, diffused here, but this is showing the temperature stratification, that contribution to density, and you can see it's kind of deeper in the water column and more spread out than the salinity stratification. Salinity is really important in the upper ocean and forms a very sharp um, stratification layer. Since I'm kind of short on time, I'm not going to even talk about these other things. But um, the, the message here is that salinity is important. If instead you were to sit at one place, so this is similar to what Bot was trying to motivate earlier, and just measure temperature and salinity really at high resolution for a short period of time, you see variability in time as well. So here, the temperature time series, you see diurnal heating in the upper 20 meters. Um, I'm going to ignore these again just due to time. Salinity, you see that there's fronts in the mixed layer where you have fresher water and saltier water. Um, and then here is, these are plots related to the measured turbulence. Um, and so this structure uh, and the winds will impart momentum and you will get turbulent mixing of this temperature and salt. And the details of that are sort of related to project 3A, where you'll be doing some 1D mixed layer modeling. So I wanted to show this. But just quickly, the takeaways from uh, this, that the Indian Ocean is special. <laughs> there is a seasonal reversal of winds and circulation. That leads to changes in the surface fluxes that then um, impact the, the upper ocean temperature and salinity stratification. Um, salinity in the Bay of Bengal in particular is very important and can stabilize the ocean. And while I didn't show this to too great of a detail in some of those plots, um, you could see subsurface warm layers. And so temperature stratification can actually um, destabilize, but salinity is enough to keep the density stratification stable. And then in all of this, um, just keep in mind that you know, when you see these schematics or climatology, that there's a lot of spatial and temporal variability that's getting averaged in. And some of those details that these products are not resolving are important.
Um, and, and potentially there's implications of these processes for coupling, which is what MISO-BOB is about. So we can stop. Uh, no, it will evolve in time um, because you're, you're heating and cooling the ocean. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the dynamics. It, it depends on if you're, if you're not forcing it, it will be in steady state. <laughs> if you're forcing it or if there's movement, if there's advection, it will evolve in one location, right? Um, so if you, this is, we'll go to this 1D modeling lecture that Leah will give tomorrow. Um, but if you're sitting in one place, you can either sense changes associated with actually forcing, um, so sources and sinks at that place, um, or you can sense changes just because you're advecting different waters by you. And so um, you, what you measure in terms of DT, DT, or DS, DT will depend on, on those. Is there a way to see why there is more variability in short wave than in long wave? Um, yeah, so the short wave, if it is cloudy, you are very effectively blocking the short wave radiation, right? And so, you know, when it's clear, you get the clear sky theoretical value that Bot was showing in some of his, roughly. When it's cloudy, you can block that short wave. On a daily basis, short wave goes to zero. <laughs> and then in day, it gets, it's really big. In terms of the long wave, again, even though you correct for the downward piece, it is you know, the seven Boltzmann constant times the measured temperature to the fourth power. And the variability in sea surface temperature, especially in the Bay of Bengal, is just not very large. And so that term just won't change very much. Uh, yeah, sorry, someone. <laughs> yeah, so that is what's plotted right here. This is the turbulent diffusivity from the float. So this is actually, this was a free floating profiler. It was an Argo float, and it had an upward lurking thymister. So one of the advantages of it is you get clean data up through the surface. This is KT. It's measured from temperature microstructure. So if the temperature gradient is very small, you, I mean, there are issues with resolution. Um, what's that? The positive and negative, yes, yeah, so that's the cool thing about this plot. If you look at the temperature stratification, it changes sign. Um, so that's plotted in the third panel. For some reason, the blues are really washing out in this projector, but I think you can see them. So there's these, or you can look at the top, there's these subsurface warm layers. So at night, the temperature is actually cool above warm, but during the day, it's warm above cool. And so that controls the sign of the surface heat flux. That's great. I didn't have time to do that, so I'm glad you asked the question. <laughs> All right. What's next on the schedule? Yeah.